checking through my YouTube comments and I had some uh, wonderful folks who are subscribers who shared a suggestion to provide some lessons learned from my recent trip on the Pine Mountain Trail with my sister. I thought that was just an amazing idea. So I've made a list of 10 things that I learned that I think would also be useful for you. And so I'm gonna run down that list. And um, the very last one I think is super important. So bear with me while I get to the end of the list and hopefully it might even be a lifesaver. So first one, keep your gear dry. Uh, I know that sounds like a no-brainer, but you have to be super careful, especially if it's rainy or even humid, to make sure that your stuff stays dry, especially if you've got down. Uh, and this was a problem for my sister because we were waiting out the rainstorms and she hadn't put her underquilt yet on yet uh, and she w allowed it to get a little bit damp so when she actually did put it onto her hammock um, it wasn't really protecting her as much as it should and so she ended up being a lot more cold than she should have been. So do your best to keep your gear dry, use a pack liner if you need to, put things in dry sacks, uh, whatever it takes to make sure that you stay dry so that you can stay warm on the trail. Second, get to camp early. <laughs> um, there was a rule at the Pine Mountain Trail. The ranger said you're supposed to be in camp two hours before sunset. I thought it was one hour and we were aiming for that, but we actually were a little bit further out than we thought. It took a little longer to get there than we thought. And we did get there uh, probably about 30 minutes before the sun went down. And it was just very nice to be able to get the lay of the land a little bit, to have the sun that we needed to be able to pick a good camp site, a good place to put my tent that would be well drained. And also to check up above, you never know what kind of trees might be above you, especially if you get there in the dark. Uh, just much safer if you have some sunlight that you can kind of scope things out, do your camp chores, get it set up. So highly recommended if possible to get to camp early. Number three, have a contingency plan. When I checked in and talked to the rangers, we knew the weather was not gonna be ideal. We knew it was gonna be cold and rainy. And they told me, if you have any issues, feel free to just call. And they actually had two emergency numbers, one that took voice messages and one that was text, so that we could get in touch with them if we needed to. And at the time, I didn't think that we would, but we did. And so it was very lucky that we were able to get in touch with the ranger and they actually came to get us out, took me to my car so I could pick my sister up and get her back to her car. So it was just wonderful to know what that contingency plan was. Uh, you won't have that everywhere and even on the AT, but if you know somebody that you can call that's a backup, um, if you've got lists of shuttle drivers who could pick you up if need be, it can be tremendously helpful. So know that before going in. Don't just assume that your phone is going to work and that you'll be able to get that information. Make sure you have a backup plan and you know who you're going to call if you need to call somebody. Number four, <laughs> forget modesty. Um, you guys that are watching, it's probably not that big a deal, but for women, um, you know, we go through all kinds of um, <laughs> gymnastics in order to uh, try to maintain uh, modesty. But when you're out in the woods, it really doesn't matter. And I learned, um, particularly on the second night, that um, there's not always a big tree or a big rock to hide behind. So some of those trees are like this big <laughs> and um, you're gonna be mooning somebody, even if it's just a squirrel or a chipmunk. <laughs> so don't worry about it you got to do your thing just to find the right place make sure that it's away from water and that um, it's an appropriate place that you bury you know, dig a cat hole bury things appropriately um, but you got to do what you got to do right number five get water when you can uh, the first night we camped in a site that had a beautiful water source right there. The second night when we went down to a whiskey still campground, it was a long way down and we actually bypassed a stream and we thought, you know, should we stop and get water or should we keep going? And we made the call to not stop. So we hiked on, it was probably about another mile or so, and we each had about half a liter of water. We figured, well, there's a camp, a water source um, at the campsite and the ranger had told me it was a good water source. What she didn't tell me was that it was a quarter mile away from the campsite. And because uh, it started raining shortly after we got there and we were still setting up, we decided to hunger down until the rain had passed and then it was dark. And uh, so we had to wait till morning to get our water. And it turns out that, you know, we could have gone in the dark down the trail, but I wasn't comfortable doing that when the rain stopped. And so we waited and it was a good thing we did because there was a big blowdown that we actually had to get off the trail to get around the blowdown to find our way to the spring that was a quarter mile away. So that was an extra half mile that we had to hike to get water in the morning. And we would have just been so much more comfortable, had plenty of water for tea or um, hot cocoa or anything that we wanted in the evening if we had just stopped a little bit before camp to get the water just to be safe. 
next tip, and this is really important, just to know when you've had enough. I know for my sister it was a little bit hard to say, okay, I just don't have another night in me, not another night like this in the cold, cold weather. Uh, and it actually happened to a friend of mine too this past weekend. She was hiking with a friend of hers and they got real cold and even a little dehydrated and they you know, on a four night or excuse me, a four day trip ended up having to bail on the second day. And again, very experienced hikers, those two, and they knew when enough was enough still felt bad about it but you know what it's better to be safe than to be um, miserable and unhappy and potentially injured so there's no shame in saying okay this is just not working out I need to as they say in football call an audible <laughs> make the call to get out if you need to get out and don't be afraid to do it it's okay you've learned something and you will take that knowledge with you into your next hike number seven don't rely on the weather forecast I'm a sailor and typically when you sail, you can see the rain coming from miles away. It's pretty easy to predict what the weather's going to be, but when you're in the mountains, you may not be able to see over the next ridge to see how that weather's coming. And there are so many different kind of microclimates depending on which side of a ridge you're on and whether you're on the top of a mountain or whether you're down low in a gap. So all of those things make a difference and you may have a weather report on your phone, but it might not be accurate. For example, the second day we were hiking and we thought the rain was gonna come at 10 a.m. That's what the weather report said. And then it turned into 11 and then 12 and then one. And this went on all day. And we did, we hiked all day ready to get rained on, but we didn't. We got to camp and then it came. And looking at, thankfully I did have coverage, um, even though I've got T-Mobile, which my daughter calls T-Maybe. <laughs> I was really shocked that I had uh, cell coverage down there in the gap and um, was checking the weather forecast to see when the rain would stop and it would keep saying rain is starting and then rain is stopping and then rain is starting again. And even the radar was a little bit unpredictable trying to see. So it just can't uh, depend 100% on the weather forecast. You have to use your own good sense and um, take advantage of any opportunity that presents. Like when it, the rain slowed down about seven-ish and I said, you know what, I'm getting out of my tent. I'm gonna cook some something, made some hot water so I could have some soup uh, with that little bit of water that I had left. And um, just have to sometimes use your instincts uh, instead of relying on somebody else to report the weather for you. Number eight, and this is something that the, the Graham weenies, if you want to call them that, might disagree with, but I think it's important to carry an emergency blanket. They cost about three bucks and weigh next to nothing, and it's a valuable piece of gear to have on you, even in a day pack if you're just doing a day hike because things can change in an instant. So I carry an emergency blanket, and I found that I did need to use it when we were in the tent, my sister and I, because the temperature was dropping about a degree in an hour, and by the time you know she called uncle <laughs> and crawled in the tent with me, she was pretty pretty chilly, I think maybe even early stages of hypothermia, and it was getting colder and colder and colder. About 4.30 in the morning, I said, you know what, Kate, I'm gonna take out my emergency blanket. I'm just gonna spread it over the both of us because it's gonna help us stay a little bit warmer. And it made a huge difference for the rest of the night or the rest of the early morning hours. We were much more comfortable, and I was happy to sacrifice that blanket. I mean, I tried to fold it up again. <laughs> They're technically reusable, but not really. So I will probably just buy a new one for my next hike to keep for the next time. But a very little inexpensive piece of equipment that could potentially save your life. So do carry an emergency blanket. Number nine, eat. Eat even if you're not hungry. Um, I think it's helpful to just be able to snack along the trail, to have some snacks in your pocket, some energy chews, little things, because what a lot of people think is, oh, well, I've heard about hiker hunger and I'm gonna be ravenous. And then they find out that they get on the trail and they're not hungry, so they don't eat and they don't have the energy that they need for the next day for that big climb or even for the next, you know, half mile that might be ahead of them or between them and camp. So it's good to have food and just kind of feed your system a little bit of time as you go to stay, um, to stay energized. And also uh, along those lines to have kind of mix and match meals because maybe you plan a big meal that you don't want to eat but you do want to kind of switch things up a little bit. So I find that it's helpful to have things that I can turn into multiple meals and um, you know, or a meal that I might be planning for lunch that I could have for dinner if I'd rather or eat half my dinner and save the rest for the next day. Just things like that that make your food a little bit more flexible instead of being locked in. Uh, a good example would be if you have just mountain house meals, then you're either eating it or you're not. 
but if you have some tortillas and some cheese and some nuts and things like that then you can switch things up a little bit to suit your taste and that also helps because if you find you're in a situation where you're going to be out longer than you expected and you need to conserve food then it's pretty easy to do that and you can spread your meals out over a few extra days so eat when you can and make sure you eat now finally the last and most important one is hyperthermia and hydration they go hand in hand you may not realize that when it's cold out even when it's only in the you know 50s or so if it's windy and you're the air is dry you're losing a lot of fluids just by breathing and if you've got on layers and you're kind of warm underneath and you're sweating then you're losing more fluids that way and the more fluids you lose the more your body tends to kind of shut down uh, a little bit it closes in on itself and stops sending uh, fluids to your extremities so then they get colder and before you know it you could be in a situation where you're facing hypothermia my sister i think was in the early stages of that when she, thankfully she had the good sense at about 11 30 at night to call out to me and say hey joey <laughs> i need to crawl in your tent uh, which just relieved me incredibly because i was worried about her um, and the same thing with my friends that were hiking that i mentioned last weekend um, they had the good sense um, to know that things weren't quite right and one of the things to look for in terms of is somebody dealing with maybe early stage hypothermia is what I heard just recently in one of my Facebook groups, uh, and I've seen it online since, is watch for the umbles, uh, which is stumble, mumble, grumble, and fumble. Uh, pretty easy to remember. And what that means is basically if, if somebody that you're with is starting to kind of lose their gait, they're not walking smoothly, uh, if they're fumbling around things, their hands don't seem to be working right, and they're like, oh, I just can't hold on to this, you know? Um, if they're grumbling, they're getting grumpy, or their personality kind of starts to change, if their words aren't coming out the right way, then that's a sign that maybe there's something that you need to do for them to get them warmed up, or there's just get them to drink something hot, make sure they're hydrated a little bit more, make sure that they are properly warm. Um, take the steps that you need to protect them from getting any further into hypothermia. And as she relayed to me, she says, you know what, um, one of them sounded like she was drunk when I talked to her at, you know, early in the morning. And that's a good sign of the, the mumbles and the stumbles that she wasn't doing well. So those are things to keep in mind and just be wary that hypothermia can sneak up on you, particularly if you are somewhat dehydrated and if you're not in the habit of drinking a lot on the trail, you may not even realize that you're dehydrated. So just be very careful in um, any kind of cold, windy conditions that you are drinking a lot and that you are uh, vigilant for signs of hypothermia because it can sneak up on you even when it's not ridiculously cold and it can be very dangerous. So stay safe. I hope that's been helpful and if you have any more questions feel free to put a note in the comments and again thank you to everyone who's been subscribing. I'm so delighted to see so many people are interested in um, what I have to say and um, I hope that I can continue to bring you good videos. So thank you for watching and I'll, I'll see you soon. Take care.